Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, part two of our symposium at uh, Colorado State University. Uh, for those of you who joined us yesterday, we're glad that you uh, are here again today with us. And um, we're treated to a really phenomenal, phenomenal artist talking conversation with Magdalena Dundo yesterday. Uh, today is kind of the second part of this uh, mm -hmm. symposium that's uh, built around a few exhibitions at the Alucard Museum here at CSU. And uh, I just want to welcome all of you here. And I'm going to ask uh, my colleague and uh, co-discussant, Professor Del Harrow, to uh, say a quick hi and also show a, a message from our director of the Alucard Museum, Lynn Boland. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for coming and joining us. Um, I'm just going to play Lynn's video. Hi, I'm Lynn Boland, director and chief curator of the Gregory Alucard Museum of Art at You're Colorado State now? University. And I've got some oral surgery coming up, so I'm coming to you by video, but it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this online symposium held in conjunction with two current exhibitions at the museum. Shattering Perspectives, a teaching collection of African ceramics, was curated by CSU students under the direction of Dr. David Reap, CSU Associate Professor of Art History and Associate Curator of African Art at the Museum. Richard DeVore and the Teaching Collection was curated by CSU Associate Professors Sanam and Ami and Del Haro and further expands on the significance of the university museum and the pedagogical value of its collection. I offer my profound thanks and congratulations to the faculty curators for these engaging exhibitions and for conceiving and organizing this important program. These exhibitions were made possible by generous support from the Fund Endowment at CSU and by Colorado Creative Industries. CCI and its activities are made possible through an annual appropriation from the Colorado General Assembly and federal funds from the National Endowment for the Arts. We're also dearly grateful to the panelists for this symposium for bringing their expertise to bear in a multidisciplinary discussion around these exhibitions. And to our keynote speaker, the internationally renowned ceramicist Magdalene Odundu, to whom I offer our most profound <laughs> thanks and admiration. This talk is co-sponsored by the museum as part of our Critic and Artist Residency Series. Founded in 1997, CARS brings prominent artists, critics, and curators to the Colorado State University campus, now virtually, for public lectures, open forums, classroom visits, and student critiques. Dame Magdalene's talk is also co-sponsored by the Department of Art and Art History, as part of the Scott Artist Lecture Series. We are dearly grateful to the department and to all of the individuals who make these series possible. And again, thank you all for being a part of this program. All right, thanks for, uh, for sharing that, Del. So uh, everyone here today, I just wanna quickly go over the, uh, the format for our time together, and then I'll introduce our panelists, and then we'll get the discussion going. So. We have uh, we've allotted two hours for our time today, and the first hour is going to be a panel discussion between uh, our three participants with previously generated talking points, uh, followed by an hour of Q&A where uh, we will be able to uh, accept questions from all of you out uh, in the great beyond. Uh, we'll ask that you just submit your questions in the chat part uh, of our Zoom meeting, and uh, Dell and I can uh, get a hold of those and share them with our uh, participants in the, uh, the second half of our chat today. So it's my great, great, great pleasure to introduce three phenomenal speakers that uh, are going to lead us through a, a stimulating discussion today uh, around this notion of the materiality of clay. And before I introduce them individually, I just want to briefly say that the idea for this, um, when we, uh, when Dell and, and Sonam and I were thinking about what we could uh, potentially uh, bring with a, a symposium. The exhibitions at the Alucard Museum, uh, the one featuring the African ceramics is called Shattering Perspectives. And it was a student curated show. And one of the main driving points was to try to uh, provide different perspectives or unique, unique perspectives, um, maybe outside of the norm. And especially when it comes to um, having these physical engagements with objects. And so as we were coming up with uh, ideas for having a symposium, the three of us, uh, Del, myself, and Sonam, wanted to come up with 
uh, a series of speakers who could equally bring very, very, very diverse different perspectives on this notion of clay and, uh, and ceramic bodies. And so uh, it's out of this ideation that I am just thrilled to introduce our three participants today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Magdalena Dundo, who was our keynote speaker yesterday. And Adundo is best known for her hand-built ceramics made with a traditional coiling technique and without the use of a potter's wheel. Her pieces are left unglazed and are burnished by hand. She was awarded the African Art Recognition Award by Detroit Institute of the Arts in 2008 and the African Heritage Outstanding Achievement in the Arts Award in 2012, together with honorary doctorates from the University of Florida and University of the Arts London. She was appointed Officer of the Order of the British Empire for Services to Art in 2008 and Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in the 2020 New Year Honors for Services to Art and Arts Education. Her work is included in permanent collections of nearly 50 international museums, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Well, welcoming you, Magdalene, and we appreciate your time here today. Yeah. Our next panelist is Douglas Dawson, and Douglas's interest in ceramics began at Antioch College when, after attempting to register for classes, found that only ceramics courses were available. After a few months, the instructor suggested he study in Japan, where he became an apprentice to a master potter for several years. After returning to the US, he received a grant to study traditional ceramics of Guatemala. He spent several years in Guatemala researching the vestiges of pre-Columbian ceramic traditions in contemporary Highland Maya pottery. Upon returning to the US, he became a production potter as part of an alternative community in Northeastern Iowa. Tiring of poverty, he moved to Chicago and opened an ethnographic art gallery, which successfully operated for 35 years. He was always looking for areas of non-Western art that he felt were overlooked and that included African ceramics. He produced many exhibitions and spent time on the African continent, both collecting and researching traditional earthenware. Most recently, he has been working with a contemporary Zulu potter, Nkane Nzunza, whose work is now in several American and European museums and numerous private collections. He is now retired and making far too many pots in his studio in Northeastern Iowa. And he continues to marvel at the riches, uh, richness and complexity of African pots and potters. So we welcome you also, Douglas. We appreciate your time and look forward to your contributions. And our third speaker is Dr. Sue Ellen Meltzer. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences Department at Colorado State University. She received her bachelor's and master's degrees in the geological sciences from the University of Colorado and her doctorate in soil science from Colorado State University. Her background in sedimentary geology has laid the foundation of her current research interests which is to study how physical, chemical, and biological processes in differing environments around the world influence soil genesis. The susceptibility of soils to alter in response to climatic and land use conditions is top priority on her research agenda. So Ellen also works in close collaboration with the USDA and RCS and the NPS to develop accessible data and educational material that will enable a link between educators, researchers, students, and park managers. As an educator, Sue Ellen is a firm believer in developing top quality science courses for the live and virtual classroom. She currently teaches pedagogy, global environmental sustainability, and physical and environmental geology. When not in the field, laboratory, or classroom, Sue Ellen simply enjoys spending time with her family, either hiking in the Colorado mountains or building sand castles on the Florida beaches. And I should also note that before Sue Ellen took her journey into the sciences, she pursued studio arts. So we might uh, hear about that a little bit as well. So welcome Sue Ellen. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time and look forward to uh, a great conversation between all three of you. So without further ado, I'm just going to uh, throw out one of these uh, first prompts and uh, invite the three of you to, uh, to discuss. So uh, I guess maybe a, an appropriate place to start is to ask uh, about your interest in either clay or soil or ceramics. How did each of you first develop this interest and uh, perhaps tell us a little bit why that is the case? Um, and if it's helpful, uh, perhaps we can start with you, Magdalene. Oh. 
Thank you. I was hoping I'd be the last one to. <laughs> <laughs> um, my interest in clay actually comes uh, much later. I, I started working um, in, in the arts through working with an advertising agency. I went straight from my, what we call A-level, um, which is, I think, in the States pre university uh, grades and went straight as an apprentice in an advertising agency, which um, was later bought by Ogilvy and Mather, which is quite a big advertising agency. And it's, and then worked as an, an, an assistant in Neon Design and Manufacturing Company, which was a, 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 a company that created all the road signs in East Africa. Then went to, I think I got to a stage where I found an impasse in developing my own work and was very encouraged to go to England uh, to pursue um, uh, tr some training, some form of training in, in art. And that's how I ended up at Cambridge College of Art and design in England and studied uh, on the foundation course, which I found absolutely um, uh, fascinating and interesting because it offered practically every form of art, an introduction of you know every form of art practice. And it is within that uh, first year, with sorry, within my second year when I, I had decided to go on to the uh, uh, BA commercial art course that I became very disillusioned with advertising and um, started um, skiving off as we call it, um, spending more and more time with the pottery teacher uh, who, who happened to actually had been born in Zimbabwe and uh, took, took quite an, an interest in what I was um, doing in those evening classes and encouraged me to, when I decided that I didn't really want, um, I didn't find it comfortable being in the commercial art area. She encouraged me to go to uh, a college that offered um, other crafts and I ended up in Farnham and to be honest in my interview I was asked quite a lot about ceramics and each answer was absolutely nothing because I knew very little about uh, ceramics um, but you, you know after a while it you know surprisingly I got very comfortable working with clay so cut uh, the biography short, I started working in clay in around 1973, 73, 74. Does anybody else want to jump in, either Douglas or Sue Ellen? Doesn't matter. Um, Douglas, I'm do you want to go next? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Right, you know, I think when when one looks back uh, as, a, as a, a recently arrived elder, it's very easy to create a, a, a narrative that seems to be very cohesive and linear, when in fact it's, of course, full of jumps and starts. But interest, perhaps, and this is kind of interesting in context of the theme of this particular symposium, I think my interest in clay really originated with my interest in geology. Um, and having always been interested in earth sciences, and that led me in college uh, to wind up in a ceramic course. Um, and as Dave said, uh, you know, a really important juncture in my life was this apprenticeship in Japan. Not only did I learn how to make Japanese ceramics, more importantly, uh, and this is under the tutelage of this exceptional master potter, he really taught me how to see and how to look at things and, and make connections. And this is, relevant because this is really how I arrived at African ceramics. I became very interested in medieval Japanese ceramics, often associated with tea ceremony, 
uh, the whole Wabi concept of aesthetics, that very peculiar aesthetic that the Japanese became sensitized to in a way that no one else in the world seems to have been. And that, that aesthetic of the incomplete, of the rustic yet sophisticated, uh, I mean, Japanese aesthetics are usually defined in terms of contradictions like that, elegant and simple, rustic, but uh, refined. And I started looking at, with that kind of visual vocabulary that I developed looking at medieval Japanese ceramics, I started looking at African ceramics and I saw the exact same end result, but coming from a diametrically opposite direction and a completely different philosophical and aesthetic analysis of the work. In other words, looking at uh, a 15th century Japanese tea container that was now elevated into the pinnacle of Japanese fine art and its rustic rope decorated surface. And then looking at a traditional 19th century water jar from Mali and seeing essentially the exact the same pot, the same aesthetic, the same texture, the same form, but a very different, as I said, philosophical understanding and appreciation of the pots. Um, then I returned to the United States, as Dave said, and, and uh, became very interested in sort of the continuum of ceramics. And in Guatemala, uh, I would go to Highland Mayan Indian village, look at how they were making pots, using pots, decorating pots, thinking about pots, and then comparing that with what I was also studying in pre ancient pre-Columbian ceramics. And finding that continuum and that connection, I found that extremely intriguing. So I think I've continually, ceramics has been sort of a vehicle for me for really making connections. And it of course is the great uh, artistic craft common denominator in the world. And as I, I'm already getting into a, something I find very annoying and that is that, that very tiresome conversation about art versus craft, which seems to just go on and on and on in the West and happily in kind of places like Japan, it's a completely unknown conversation. So I've been very interested in, in exploring that of how people arrive at, how they make aesthetic decisions, their relationship with their environment. Uh, that has to do with geology, with archeology. span um, I happen to live part-time on this farm uh, in Northeast Iowa, which is adjacent to Effigy Mounds National Monument, which of course is this incredible resource of prehistoric earthworks and how that all, and maybe I'll talk about that a little later, but basically, so that's my history of how I became interested and frankly obsessed with ceramics. Mm -hmm. I've never made a pot I didn't want. Never, I've never seen a pot <laughs> I didn't want or never seen a pot I didn't like. Uh, it's, an, it's a very heavy obsession. <laughs> that's great. It, it sounds like we, uh, we suffer from a, uh, a, a similar uh, obsession. Um, so Ellen, what about you? I'm, I'm really intrigued to hear your- Yeah, this is <laughs> hard to follow up. Um, there's obviously and clearly something very special about clay um, and um, you all sort of spoke to that already, you know, I mean, I think most people start an interest in clay when they're children, right, and playing in the in the soil, playing in the ground, playing with clay, because that's essentially what you're playing with. So um, I can go back that far, but I will spare you. Um, the story from when I was a child. I really started my interest in clay um, as a geologist. So like Douglas, I um, started to look at clay a bit more seriously from the, from the lens of a geologist. Um, as, as David mentioned, I do have um, a background in the arts. I went to art school up until college when I had to decide, you know, what serious career am I gonna partake in? And science was my other passion. And so I took my first geology class and um, what I started to, to understand and what I was a bit in awe of as an undergraduate um, in geology was the cycles. I started to recognize that cycles were all around me. And in particular, the cycle of generating material through mountain building and then destroying that material through plate, plate tectonics and subduction zones and how we're continuously making things on earth and destroying things and earth itself is doing that. And so increasingly, I was interested in this synthesis destruction cycle and how it showed up in all systems, including in soil. Um, and so in fact, it's this weathering process 
from the lens of a geologist that led me to becoming a soil scientist. Um, and said, you know, I studied sedimentary geology specifically, took a soils class, and um, through this weathering process and the, and the interaction between the hydrosphere and the biosphere and the lithosphere and the atmosphere, this place that we call the critical zone where you have all these interactions that form soil was really intriguing. And, um, and there again, I saw this synthesis and destruction in which we formed clays then, right? Where you're taking these primary minerals that are being formed through geologic processes that are then exposed to weathering processes and those primary minerals are destroyed and you're synthesizing these secondary minerals, which are clays. And through that, through that synthesis, you're creating this stable material in the soil that's ultimately supporting life, right? And so at the end of the day, it's this, it's, it's this, synthes this, this synthesizing and this destruction, this cycle and how we can trace that in everything we do. But here's now a medium where we're bringing in all of these spheres to support life on earth. And, um, and that sort of opened up a whole new world of study and learning and understanding what that actually means to understand these life-giving processes. So beautiful. Um, thank, thank you, everyone. That was such a wonderful, an all wonderful answers to that first question. I feel like this is like already more than we could have hoped for from this panel. Um, <laughs> Sue Ellen, we, we were kind of chatting beforehand about, Sue Ellen was sort of mentioning that any of these questions, it's like they could kind of be answered from a philo philosophical perspective, you know, the perspective of science or the perspective of art and aesthetics. And Sue Ellen, I feel like you did all of that, like in that answer, so not in front of the <laughs> philosophical, the aesthetic and the, and the poetic altogether there. Um, I feel like you actually started to really speak to the second question um, that we had um, so maybe Douglas or Magdalene, maybe one of you could sort of build on this, but our second question was just, why is clay important? And, um, and then there was sort of a second part of how this translates or applies to ceramics. Um, and I guess this is a little bit of a sort of semantic distinction. And I guess what we were thinking of was, you know, sort of the soil, um, the, the clay kind of coming out of the earth in relation to ceramic objects or artworks or artifacts, sort of how do those relate to each other and how does that importance of clay relate to the significance of ceramic objects? Um, so, mm. Douglas? Yes, or? I, I, I just want to say how um, astonished and amazing Douglas's root was so uh, uh, to, to clay and, ceram and, and pottery was so rooted very early on because for me it took me uh, many years to actually real to to really understand why why clay why why pottery why ceramics and um, I think Douglas touched on the universality of of clay and and amazingly the pieces that really touched me uh, very early on were those pieces, the Jamon pieces, the cord relating pieces that were reminiscent of the pottery that I had seen or that I was aware of as a child in, in growing up in, in Kenya. But it is that universality that, that use the fact that a pot is a pot and wherever you, 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 you went, people really understood you 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 know i think for millennium and and in all cultures you you didn't have to i think my my obsession is that you know you don't actually have to express it to to have an explanation of what a pot is in any context in any society and if you look at the pieces that uh, in the collection that you have now in the in the exhibition, and you took those to Santa Fe for argument's sake, you you know sort of unless you somebody asked you where they came from, I'm I'm sure 
people in Santa Fe would just understand those pieces as having been made by somebody and not just manufactured in, in an, uh, uh, an anonymous kind of uh, uh, position. And that's, that's what's fascinating about it. The other thing about the material is that clay is such a simple material. It's such, it has its complexities in, geo, in, in geological terms, in, in firing terms, which is then physics and its chemistry. But as a material to use, you can, as Suelen mentioned earlier, even as a child, you know, sort of just, just the tacticity of the clay, the mold, the maneuverability of it is so, at, so attractive and so natural that anyone can actually put their hands in a, in, in, in a bucket or in the, in the ground and start molding something out of that. And, and when you think about it, that's probably why even in biblical terms, the notion that man was made out of clay um, and, 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 and those stories become manifested in the, the way man thinks and the way man wants to express themselves. Um, uh, and, and I think it's, it's, it's humanity trying to understand ourselves on this soil that we walk upon and that we, we um, sort of uh, excavate to, to build things around us, including architecture and, and utilitarian pieces of work. But we also make reverent, you know, sort of work that kind of manifest themselves into uh, 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 thinking or religious or um, right rituals and rites of passage. I don't think there are many uh, nations that don't have a notion that you know, sort of uh, a container is something that sustains us as living people because we come from it and then we go back to it. Um, beyond that, you know, I leave it to people like Suelle and to, to start talking about Titanics and, you know, and uh, eruptions and <laughs> the breakdown of, of, of the clay particles or even archeologists who, uh, uh, persist on breaking uh, pieces of, of ceramic so that they can study the clay particles in them. But it's, uh, you know, we're very lucky. It's a fascinating area. I've taken up everybody's time now. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll jump in at this point. You know, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not a religious person at all. Um, but I've always been fascinated with people's uh, near-death experiences where they're dying and they're suddenly in a tunnel and there's a great white light at the end and as they're about to enter heaven, there's their grandparents and their pets and everyone's there waiting for them. That's not what I want to see. I want to see a, something flashing in front of me telling me why I have been so fascinated with ceramics my entire life. I want like a big blinking billboard there at the end of the tunnel. Um, because it's it's that common denominator and that that my own personal quest for sort of understanding the appeal of, of soil, of clay. And I think of a couple of examples, I think that really illustrate that connection. And I, these, this whole theme of this symposium is very interesting to me. And it's actually, I think rather complicated to really address that connection because it is deeply personal and deeply philosophical. And then if you're in an African village and you're talking to potters, it's very hard to have that kind of conversation because I think that very few of us are really capable of quantifying or objectifying our relationship with ceramics and with material. But I think, again, I, as I mentioned earlier, my farm in Northeast Iowa is adjacent to Effigy Mounds National Monument. And these are huge earthen constructions in the shape of, 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 of cones, of linear mounds, of effigy mounds in the shape of animals, very totemic. But the interesting thing about these mounds to me has always been how they were constructed. They were originally constructed by scraping down to a sterile level of soil. 
And then different soils were brought in for, often from great distances, which obviously had metaphorical or symbolic significance for the prehistoric Amerindians who were constructing them. And they would construct them layer cakes, a, a layer of red ochre, and then a layer of a yellow clay, and then a layer of a blue clay, and then maybe a loam, and then maybe a funeral or an interment on top of that. So they were acutely and intimately connected with their physical environment in a way that I think is something that many of we, as people who are interested in ceramics or are making ceramics, could have grasped for that kind of connection. I know, and part of this question was really how, how does a, a clay possibly affect the personality or the character uh, of a vessel, of a pot? And I think, again, a, a very clear example of that, I think this is, um, this is a really perplexing question because I'm not sure how many potters are really thinking about that. I think the vast majority of contemporary potters are using commercial clays as I am. And that in itself is a huge disconnect. So to the degree that using, you know, what are, what are referred to by a number of contemporary potters as wild clay, clay that they are mining themselves, that again, I think reestablishes that very intimate and maybe really ineffable connection. But I think, again, if you're looking at how clay can really inform the character of a pot, if you look at Shigaraki ceramics of Japan, which I'm sure many potters who may be listening today are, it's the, it's a, the clay is so impregnated with feldspirific granules, I can't even imagine how it's thrown, but the result is a surface that is immediately identifiable to anybody as a Shigaraki pot. And there's no deviating from that. The character of the pot is so intimately connected with the nature of the clay that it's a single unit. But that's, I think that that's quite rare, but I think it's something that is really important and has a whole nother dimension to kind of the identity of the vessel. Um, and maybe I'll stop there and we'll turn it over to Sue Ellen. Thanks. Um... Again, I think that why is clay so important? I think for, from my perspective, um, you know, all the things that you mentioned, certainly um, culturally and aesthetically, <coughs> clay has great significance. Um, ultimately for me, clay is important because it supports um, and really is the foundation from which civilizations are built both culturally and physically. Um, in soil science, the, the term clay refers to particles that are less than two micrometers in size and diameter. Um, and it also refers to a particular class of, of minerals, right? So they're hydro aluminosilicate minerals. So here civilizations are built from a very particular group of, of minerals that are less than two microns in size. And to me, that's fascinating. Um, really, the utility comes from um, the fact that clays are the source for many of the chemical and physical properties of soil, um, and as such are the medium for plant growth and providing us with food um, and fiber and um, all of the things that we can make as utility from, from soil and specifically from clay. Um, it also relates to other, other things that civilizations depend on, like um, water, having fresh water, right? And just the, the properties that, that clays have, those chemical properties, those are called cation exchange. Uh, soils have a cation or clays have a cation exchange capacity. And um, that allows for contaminants to um, be retained on those soils and for nutrients to be contained and released from those soils. So they're available as nutrients um, for, again, for plant growth or as a disposal medium for waste. And um, ultimately, I think that's so important. We also can look at you know, how civilizations have succeeded or failed based on the quality of those soils, which largely has to do with organic matter Right, but it also largely has to do with the clay content and how we're how we're utilizing the soils and our decision making plays such a big role in why soils are are so important and uh, maintaining that importance 
through time. That's it, it's fascinating just to hear the three of you and uh, with these varied uh, approaches to this answer, and yet all of you were kind of talking about this idea of of the source, but from different angles. Um, so when you mentioned. You know, how clays kind of maintain the physical markers of a particular source. And you earlier mentioned the kind of uh, notion of cycle and synthesis and destruction. Magdalene uh, mentioning kind of the universality of clay and then also kind of the role of archaeologists and how uh, this material is looked at and studied. And, uh, and also Douglas, you know, just your mention of the effigy mounds and even the fact that you have this great uh, marker where soils were intentionally being brought from different places. There's a, a, a significance to it. And uh, I, I wonder if we could just hear a little bit more about it. Maybe it brings us to our next prompt, talking about the relationship uh, between clay and its source. Uh, I'd love to hear from, from the three of you, just your thoughts on this relationship between uh, clay and its source, either with the material itself, uh, the impact of physically removing soil from its physical place and displacing it elsewhere, or maybe even from uh, this artistic perspective, um, an object from its context. Because you know, if you think about what we have at the Alucard Museum, we've got this phenomenal exhibition of African ceramics that come from all over the continent in Colorado. Um, is there an impact on the object when it's taken from its context in, in one place, in this case, you know, Burkina Faso or elsewhere, and then all of a sudden it's here in Colorado. Is there any kind of a relationship or impact either on the vessel or on the material? Uh, Douglas, maybe we can start with you on this. Wow, I mean, there's so many approaches to this. I think, I mean, I've always, this has always been a controversy, this is particularly a controversial uh, topic right now when uh, the whole question of who should own art, how should art be displayed, who should be talking about it has become so hyper politicized uh, and it's become an easy tool for uh, both uh, nationalism and, and ethnic identity through the, through the attempt to control art objects. And I think this is so misguided I mean, I think what art is, is this great vehicle, uh, this kind of transcendent vehicle that speaks to different people very differently in different contexts. And an, an example I'll use um, are Japan, medieval Japanese tea bowls to get back to Japan. The, the tea bowls which formed sort of the aesthetic foundation for Zen aesthetics were tea bowls used, made and used by Korean farmers in the 12th century. Japan invaded Korea, uh, brought back uh, a bunch of Korean potters and a lot of Korean rice bowls, which were made by super rustic rural potters in Korea. They were probably at the very bottom of the aesthetic uh, scale in, in Korea. In Japan, they were appropriated by these highly intellectual philosophically based tea masters. And these same super rustic, unimportant, obviously very cheap bowls became again, one of the pinnacles of Japanese Zen aesthetics. So the bowl didn't change. The bowl was the bowl. In Korea, it was a rice bowl used by poor farmers. And the same bowl in Japan, in 18th century Japan was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and repaired with gold lacquer and was named and had a pedigree and was passed on. So the bowl is still a bowl. What has changed is how we view it and how we use it and the sense of identity that it may imbue in one. Um, I think also, and in, in David, your question about uh, uh, taking, removing a thing from context and recontextualize it. I was just reading today actually about a new discovery in Stonehenge and maybe some other of, of others of you have. In Stonehenge, there's one of the circles of stone which are called blue stones. And it's been known for a very long time that they came from Wales, southern Wales. 
but it's never been known exactly where they came from. And I'm Sue Ellen, I'm sure can tell us much more about this. But just recently, very recently, they have identified the exact quarry that these stones came from. And this is by uh, scientifically and analyzing the stone and knowing exactly the context, the, where it came from in the cliff on the side of a mountain in Southern uh, Wales. But what they also discovered, and this is the real news, they've discovered that the blue stones in Stonehenge in the Salisbury Plain in England were moved from an earlier stone circle in Wales. So the first Stonehenge was in Wales. The stones were deliberately removed dragged several hundred miles to the Salisbury Plain and re-erected. Now we can only speculate on what the motivation was for this absolutely monumental task, but it probably has to do a lot with ancestor veneration, ancestor worship, where it's that these stones probably represented specific or maybe mythological figures and they were moved as such. So again, here is an object that is taken out of its original context imbued with all kinds of philosophical and certainly spiritual and religious significance and recontextualized in a new situation with new meaning and new reason to speculate on where it all came from. So I find that extremely interesting. Um, and which is why at the same time, when I look at an African pot or a, or a Joe Moan pot, and I'm glad that Magdalene, because those mentioned those, because they are, from my, from my perspective, they might as well be extraterrestrial. They are so ancient and so unbelievably complex. But when we look at those, we cannot understand what they are. We can only speculate and hope what they are. And then, you know, reap from them and take from them something that's meaningful for us, probably on, again, on the most, the most uh, abstract level. Uh, I sometimes think that this kind of reaction we have is a kind of the compost for, for intellectual thought, for creativity. Uh, and for scientific insight. Uh, so I have no problem with taking something out of its original context, putting it in another. It speaks a different language to a different crowd, but it is the same piece and it's completely legitimate activity in my opinion. I think I'm glad you say that and, and, uh, and by nature man is fairly nomadic. I mean, we keep thinking that we are very sedentary because we've settled somewhere. But to go back in a very simplistic, in a much simpler, not simplistic, but a much simpler uh, sort of notion that I, I am aware of. I, when I was in Santa Fe, I think for the ceramic, um, International Ceramic Conference, uh, I remember Virgil being trying to explain to us, to, to the audience, how sacred the, the clay the Pueblo used, how, how important it was in philosoph not, just philosoph not just practically, but philosophically. And for, for certain societies that exist like the Pueblos, all like in, in, you know, for me in, in East Africa, in Kiswahili, we do distinguish between soil as the soil that is around us that we walk on and clay, udongo, which is, uh, you know, for soil is nchanga, clay is udongo. And, and you, you do go, you, you go to look for clay in a source that the clay has settled, compacted, and been made ready by the elements for you to take out to create and mold in the fashion of util utility or in the fashion of uh, the beliefs of, of that particular society. So that there's already a distinction between how people utilize the or, or, or view the clay in those societies. I totally agree with you, uh, Douglas, in terms of our situation, those of us who actually um, use clay as an art form. I'm not saying that these societies, the Pueblos or 
or indeed my own people uh, do not have a philosophical take on the work they make, because certainly in the rites of passage in many of the societies or in healing processes, clay and, and, and the forming of the objects from the clay has a very special place and people who make them are revered or uh, 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 are, are, people are afraid of them because they have this creative uh, ability to make things. So they, they are, it, it is a complex sort of uh, um, study in, in, you know, we can't actually just at, attribute it to one or the other thing. If we're talking about those societies, they do have, they do have uh, that notion of making the work for a purpose for that society. And when it's taken out of that context, for them, that object loses its meaning when it's seen somewhere else. For us people who, for, for those of us who are in academia or who are actually studying, those become philosophical objects or historical objects that we study to embellish and enhance our understanding of other societies. So I, you know, sort of in, 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 in what I'm trying to say that is in societies where, you know, sort of making clay is still a, 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 a sort of, a, a craft or an art that is passed on and it is indigenous to those societies, the, the clay actually means the source of the clay is a very important thing. And, they, and, and I don't know whether you noticed when you were working in, in uh, those societies that everybody else around, at least I know from when I was doing my research, everybody else really respects that source and they don't actually go and, you know, sort of trample on it. And it's only happening, you know, sort of uh, where it's, it's disregarded is a very modern materialistic context. I don't know whether that makes sense. I've rambled on. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I can I I remember when um, when I was uh, as an apprentice in Japan. One day the master potter asked me to uh, hand him some a piece of clay, and I took it and I tossed it, and it landed. And he was totally incensed and said that you know this it was such a disrespectful thing, not to him but to the material, to the clay. Yeah. Um, I wanted, uh, and maybe this, I just found something recently that was written by Barbara Frank, who wrote a, a really remarkable book on Mande leather workers and potters. The Mande are uh, a large ethnic group in present day Mali. And I just, it's just a, a very short, and I've edited it for brevity, but it, again, it talks to Magdalene's final remarks about the, the almost sanctity of the clay source and how incredibly, uh, important it is to, to, to honor that. And I'm quoting from her book on Mande ceramics. Mande potters say that raw clay has nyama, a kind of energy, vital energy or heat that pervades mm -hmm. all things. If not handled properly, the clay has the capacity to destroy one's health and well-being. The power is most intense at its source, the clay pit. Men and women prepare their own special protective solutions in which to bathe prior to digging the clay. According to tradition, special sacrifices must be performed to ensure the safety of all who participate in the digging and the success of the potter's work in the coming months. It's especially taboo for menstruating women to enter the clay pit. So if that's not a very lucid testimony about the sanctity of clay uh, and whether those women and their husbands who are digging the clay articulated in those terms, I don't know, but they <laughs> live it, certainly. Yeah. yeah. And in modern times when, you know, we were, we took a trip uh, to 
Yixing. And I, I remember, you know, sort of, even though the, the, the pots from there have now become very uh, sought after in, and are globally known, uh, one of the master potters there saying that this is gold to them and it's very special and they will never attempt to, to import it, uh, to export it rather. Uh, and um, and I, I just thought that reminded me very much of uh, Pueblo and African uh, nations. And I, I know that in parts of Asia, uh, subcontinent Asia, that, that, that happens. Um, but it's that for me, it is that distinction between, you know, generally the geological formation of soil as soil and minerals, as opposed to that which is clay and is capable of being molded and fired into a permanent state status um, as an object that in future gets uh, excavated by archaeologists. To you, Suellen. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear, um, you know, Douglas, you, you, I, I love the term about the sanctity of clay that you used. And Suella, and I, I'd love to hear your, your perspective on this notion of kind of the sanctity of clay and this you know, relationship to the source or the potential impact of removing uh, clay or soil from its source. Yeah. Um, so soil and clay being um, a big constituent of soil or, or clay being sourced from soil bodies um at, of one location at least um is really unique to place um i think as the case is being made this sort of at a more philosophical level but but clay and soil is definitely unique to place and soils will differ in color texture structure chemical and physical and biological properties um and and composition and i mean even the way that we classify soils and classify clay is very much depending largely on place, which is dependent on climate, right? So we know that a lot of our world's biomes from tundra to deserts, to prairies, forests, wetlands, volcanic areas, um, those all form their unique soils and the unique combination of the different types of clay mineralogies that you may see in a particular place. So for me, it's the place that really dictates what kind of material that you're gonna have. And that's not the same everywhere around the world. And you can sort of, you know, figure out like as Douglas was saying, when something is moved, not only what, how that clay has been molded, can, can you say something about where it came from, but the clay and, and the mineralogy itself can tell you something about where it came from. Um, as far as, so that sort of ties it to source. As far as removing it from the source, I think in doing that, you're spreading information. Um, you're spreading human information. Um, and from my perspective, when you say moving clay, moving soil, my mind goes to erosion, right? Land degradation. Um, and just like we're becoming a globalized world, the more that we disturb these places, soil, um, the more land degradation you have, maybe erosion and transport of these materials. We see dust storms from Africa, coming to North America and we can trace those minerals and know that they came from Africa and we've mixed these materials and diversified those materials and, um, and disturbed them um, from their original source place. And in fact, you know, I, sampling in different areas around the world, depending on where you're sampling from, when you bring them back to other places, there's even a process that we have to go through to quarantine soils um, to see how they've um, maybe picked up biological material and, 
And so you have to go through a process to make sure that um, you're maintaining the integrity of the soils of a certain place um, before you introduce new material. So you can sort of look at this and contextualize it from many different perspectives. Um, so there's certainly a lot of value in sharing, um, sharing cultural information and finding new utility for, you know, for creating something in one place and transporting it to somewhere else. Um, but from an environmental perspective, clay is place. And, um, and then there's that whole erosion piece as well. So. It's, oh, go it's ahead, Dave. interesting just uh, how this, this whole notion of, uh, of source is, is seeming to kind of rise in the surface of, of this uh, discussion here. Um, you know, whether it be talking about the ceramic pieces that uh, we have on display at the, uh, at the museum or thinking about context or even the impact of, uh, of the material uh, itself and how that really uh, impacts the uh, either end product or object or even the world around us. Um, maybe going along with that idea, um, I'd like to push this just a little bit further and talk about this notion of kind of reciprocity. Is there uh, any kind of a responsibility or reciprocity? Uh, does that play in a role with ceramic arts or with sourcing soil or clay, uh, removing it from the environment? And just to kind of contextualize this, when Dell and I were, were talking about and trying to come up with some prompts, I'd mentioned how uh, our colleague Sanam Imami, um, she and I had brought our classes together. Um, she's uh, teaching ceramics and pottery. And when we got together, she gave everyone a lump of clay. And while she was you know, going through a lot of the, the studio processes, she just said, you know, I just want you to start working it in your hands. And it's something I'd probably done a million times. Like you mentioned, Sue Ellen, you know, playing with clay even as a child. But I noticed that all of a sudden the clay started getting stiffer and it wasn't quite as moist. And then my hands also became very, very dry. And I began thinking about this idea of exchange or reciprocity, that this material is now taking something from me. There's an, an essence of me that is now in this material, whether through you know, moisture, sweat, or even the mark of my fingers on this. There's this interesting uh, kind of exchange going on here. And so I, I wonder if, if the three of you could talk about this idea of Reciprocity, does, does reciprocity play a role in ceramic arts? Um, and you know, is there any kind of a uh, responsibility that, that we have either when creating clay or creating objects uh, from clay or from taking soil or clay from one place to another? Um, maybe continuing this idea of, of kind of uh, impact in that relationship with, with source and also with, with the individual. I, um, I see it less in terms of reciprocity, I think, and more in terms of opportunity. Um, one consistent thing, we haven't talked specifically really a lot about African ceramics today, but to address that, I think one of the things that, that has been, I've considered really remarkable about African ceramics is the absolute adherence to vessel. Even when a piece becomes extremely sculptural, it's encrusted with all kinds of figurative elements, and I'm sure there are some in the exhibition, there's always a reference to the, the primacy of vessel. And I think this is one reason I've always been so attracted to Magdalene's work. While it's certainly sculptural, they are still all vessels. The, I mean, the metaphor for procreation, for the human body, is so obvious and so potent in ceramics. And maybe that's reciprocity, but where clay offers the maker the remarkable opportunity to manifest themselves in the most corporeal manner in the surface, whether it's through fingerprints, through individual marking, however indecipherable, undecipherable that may be to someone else, it is there. And these pots are full of very specific information. If you look at the great Kurumba storage pots from Burkina Faso that are totally covered with, with um, 
references to citrication on the human body where you cut the skin and allow it to swell. Those are signatures. Those, that, is the, that is the person who made the pot. So again, I see the, the potential of ceramics as, as a metaphor for the human body, for the reproductive side of the belly. And this is constantly reinforced in the ritual use of ceramics, particularly in Africa, where they are vessels on the shrines. They're not just sculptures, they are vessels and things are placed in them to address all those issues of negotiating one's relationship with the, with the spirit world, with their ancestors, with their fellow uh, clans people. Um, that's the opportunity in ceramics, which is unique in all art forms as far as I'm concerned. So again, I see ceramics as this opportunity for the most fundamental kinds of expression. I can I kind of, yeah. oh, go ahead. Go ahead, it's Sue. <laughs> okay, um, I was just gonna jump in on the, the your, your talking about the vessel because just naturally the soil body is a vessel too. We take that clay from the soil to make vessels, utilizing a different maybe context, but almost the same context because it's like, like you were saying, maybe a vessel for giving life um, where the soil is a vessel for nutrients and clays. Soil, soil is soil because it has organic matter and because it has water and it has air and it has clay, right? If it, if it just had sediment, if it just had sand, okay, it wouldn't have necessarily those, uh, that ability to have all of these ions that are nutrients for plant uptake. And so from that perspective, soil is a vessel, a life-giving vessel, just like these vessels that we're creating to hold things and to um, make things and um, to transport things and to give life in, in different ways. And so I just wanted to sort of draw a relationship there between something that we make and something that is in its natural state already like that as well. I think that explains the, 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 the uh, beliefs and, and norms that the traditional societies have in regard to the to soil, what you soil and what you're saying. And, and hence the reverence, the, the, the uh, you know, sort of put on, on the source and the making and all the, the, and who makes the rituals that are involved with the maker. And as Douglas mentioned earlier, when they're made and, and for whom and, um, and you know, and, and that sort of thing. So I think, uh, Suelen, you are very um, right in, in uh, directing us to think of soil as a vessel from its conception and from its making. And the, the other thing to, to, to point out is that in most traditional societies in Africa and, uh, and indeed in subcontinent Asia, and uh, uh, South America and Pueblos is that much of the clay that is used is what is termed in geology terms, secondary clays. They are alluvium, they are settled clays, eroded clays that have arrived on riverbeds and, and therefore naturally sort of uh, uh, settled in on, on you know, sort of not so deep down. So they're, they're not excavated in mass, on mass, as they are in the clay that we use as potters in industrialized situations. But source is also very important in all the historical years where uh, the West were trying to mimic uh, porcelain um, to, to create this, um, translucent body um, because they had seen uh, 
you know, sort of pot from, from China and from the China clay. Hence, we have the word China for, for porcelain um, every day. It's, it's, it's their, um, their luring and, uh, and, and the, the performance of that clay to, to, to become this amazing, to, 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 to be fired and become translucent that attracted the West. And so uh, uh, the, the, the potteries, particularly in Stoke or Trent in England were created because they wanted to, to mimic the, the, the pottery that came from a specific source uh, until I think people realized, well, they can dig the soil in their own areas to make the pottery that they, they have. Um, and, but, you know, sort of, uh, I, I think your point about the source being very important and, and also being important in what kind of the, what kind of pottery and what kind of ceramics is made is very important. We, we tend to forget that globally these days because it's easy to go out and buy a bag of clay um, uh, which has been processed and all the, the elements that you talked about, the minerals and, you know, stabilize and alter to be able to make the kind of work we make today. So it's quite easy for a lot of young people or a lot of people to forget um, or not even take notice of the, 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 the source of the material and even forget that you're walking on, on soil <laughs> on, on that material itself. So I, I think we'd love to open up the conversation now to, to audience questions. Um, so if anyone has a question, if, if you would, uh, uh, could type those in the chat, we'd love to read them out. Um, maybe just while a few questions are accumulating, um, maybe just one, one kind of final prompt question that Dave and I had. And in a way, I feel like I, I'm hearing the, the conversation um, sort of circling around around this this question or thought that we had already, um, as we began, it feels to sort of delve into these questions of really of ethics and ecology um, in our relationship with materials and um, the material world. And one of the thoughts we were having, which which I feel like I'm really hearing in this language of Magdalene, as you speak about, you know. Um, the relationship of traditional societies with, with the material of clay and the way in which there's a certain meaning imbued in the language itself and the words that are used. Um, Douglas, as, as you spoke about, you know, your mentor in Japan talking about a, a sort of disrespect towards the, the material itself. Um, and then Sue Ellen, as you speak about like the, the clay as a kind of vessel, um, it seems that at times there can be a kind of implication in the very way that we use words like material, um, an assumption of the material as a kind of passive substance, you know, a sort of subject or exclusively a kind of subject of human agency. And we were wondering, and it feels like I'm, I feel like I'm hearing this in the conversation that there might be something meaningful or important in, in really reframing that kind of thinking or shifting that thinking to begin to think about the clay um, or other materials which we engage as humans as actually active sites of agency themselves. Um, I wonder if any of you have, have thoughts about that. I kind of am inclined to agree with you. <laughs> you, you know, your summation of what we're trying to, to um, express really. I mean, um, just, you know, the connection between, um, you know, the, 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 one of the images I showed at the end of my presentation yesterday, of the headdress from the Tukana uh, of uh, Northwestern Kenya, 
is, it, you know, sort of the fact that clay plays a very important uh, uh, part in, in um, sort of healing the body, but also being part of the adornment, um, you know, sort of the hair mixed with clay and then, you know, preserved because the clay, clay material itself is mixed with, with oils to, to preserve the wig and the, the, the headdress. Um, but in, in these societies, I mean, the aromas of uh, Southern uh, Ethiopia have ceremonies and so do the Dinkas have ceremonies where uh, ochres and clays play a big import, uh, a very important part in the body decoration. Um, and indeed the Zulus also um, use it for cosmetic purposes and they would, you know, sort of the, the, the clay actually touching the body is, is a very uh, essential bit. But the bit, the, the area that you touched on where we probably in our quest to make things forget the source and, and forget that, uh, forget to be mindful of uh, its perpetual use and uh, never question whether it's going, you know, we're diminishing its, its uh, existence in, in this world is the fact that uh, clay is, is used in so many other materials. I mean, cosmetics will not, would not exist without a, a, a certain element of minerals and clays. So we are constantly uh, using up um, the source of this earth and soil without um, thinking really. Uh, and perhaps uh, we might want to, to start thinking about that a lot more in, in both scientific and artistic terms and, and just being mindful um, that it may never be a perpetual source um, for future generations. I think this is um, one of the great challenges for contemporary artists uh, mm -hmm. to think about the relationship between material and artistic input or output. And I think potters are in a particularly uh, good situation to think about this. I mean, potters are acutely aware of the symbiosis between process and output. At one point, they place their work in the kiln and completely surrender it to the process of combustion. And they have some degree of control, but not all control. And it's that, that space between control and no control, which determines the character of the work ultimately. So I think potters think about this a lot. Now, when you look at something like the work of Jeff Koons, for example, where, for there is, where the materiality is, is a cynical or ironic statement. The materiality of his work, glossy chemical automobile planes on fiberglass, there's no integrity whatsoever to the material of that art. Now, what does that mean? Is it is there something there besides just cynicism? Um, so I think, I don't think it's an answer to your question, Del. I don't think, I think it's, it is a question um, of how important addressing the material nature of one's work is to an artist and what does it imbue the work with. Um, again, there's lots of historic examples that one can cite, but I think um, potters are in a unique situation to really think about that and have been thinking about it and do address it. Yeah, and I can um, try to bring this back full circle, actually. Um, you know, we started with does, does soul have agency? Well, again, it's, it's sort of the foundation for civilizations. It determines whether a society is gonna, how a society will, will be built, right? What kind of food it can grow, the materials that it can build, um, the culture that will end up thriving or using that, how it will use that material. And I, and I think that there could be sort of a fine line between what we're calling art and what we're what, and how we're using materials to mass produce for economic production. 
um, right, between a society that's utilizing a material for the sake of the survival of that and, and use for that group of peoples and what we're mass producing to really have economic gain instead of just true utility for that, again, that particular people. And so we can bring this back around to, as Magdalene was saying, for future generations um, and the sustainability of these materials and the rates from which we are synthesizing the materials because they're being synthesized geologically and at what rate we're destroying and using these materials for not just art, but for mass production as clays are being used for so many different reasons today, right? Um, right down to cosmetics. And so um, I think we do have to pay attention to the ecosystem services that, um, that clays provide us with um, because those are really important for the survival of humanity. And that's just one example of, of that. Um, and really finding this balance of the rate that these clays are being produced versus, or soils are being produced versus the rate at which they're being destroyed. And where does art fit into that, um, into that equation? Um, and I think it fits into that equation by determining the line of which it is art versus it is something that we're producing at sort of a massive scale. The other thing that we haven't really, the other issue we haven't uh, paid, a, you know, sort of considered in this discussion, uh, and it came up with the question about displacement and whether work uh, being made somewhere else goes to somewhere else and becomes something else. Um, and what, what is actually interesting in this discussion is how um, wonder, as, as much as the, the, the collection, for instance, with the exhibition you have now, and I took part in an exhibition in Munich um, uh, last year or the year before, and uh, it was a huge collection as well that was given to the um, Design Museum. What, what, what I think strikes me is particularly when we look at African or uh, uh, Pueblo pottery is the, the, the plain fact of displacement where none of these societies or, or what I'd call a cultural displacement because the, the work that we see in museum, the displacement of the cultural activity in those societies is very impacted by the fact that that work is not being made uh, in, in the same proportions that the work was made before. Um, and that these societies, they are less and less um, engagement in making, and that includes my own society, where, you know, sort of uh, the art is not seen as one that sustains you in an economic situation today, and therefore there is less discouragement in, in uh, your children going to do, to, to participate in the, the continuity of the art and the, the, the craft taking, you know, sort of continuing in those societies. And I think we need to start thinking about the implications of, you know, sort of the curriculums and the curriculars that those those societies or the, 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 the government within those societies, uh, uh, the responsibilities that we have in trying to encourage those arts uh, to continue. Are we, is it a patronizing <clears throat> uh, question to, to, or ideal to want to, to preserve the art in those societies because much of it has re been removed and 
the, the, the actual participation of those people has long gone and, 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 and is appreciated somewhere else. I'm not sure whether I'm making myself clear. But do you see, do you see what I mean? I think uh, a lot of the vessels that you see in those museums, they are places in South Africa, like the, the uh, uh, artist that Douglas is working with and some of the people that uh, David has worked with. But the, the, the economic disparities are very, uh, are, are very evident those potters in those societies do not enjoy the same uh, economic success that somebody like myself um, uh, sort of does. And do we have a responsibility in engaging in that discussion? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's now made everybody stop. <laughs> you know, it makes a huge amount of sense. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that in, in relation to sort of Sue Ellen's question that you raise about what, what is sort of the role of art in these much larger um, conversations about, you know, society, about the way in which um, we, uh, in, engage with material in the physical world um and i yeah it's it's I, I wonder i guess i wonder sometimes if there's almost a way in which art um provides in some cases maybe a sort of model i mean this is in a in a very positive sense like a sort of model for um more maybe ethical or responsible ways in which we might um, engage with the, with, with the material world um, at the scale of sort of industrial production, but also in what you're describing, Magdalene, I mean, it's, a, um, it's also a sort of mirror. Um, it feels like art sort of reflects back to us in some ways, both possibilities, but also failings. Um, which which we 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 need to engage or question um, much more deeply. Um, we're getting some. We're starting to get some great questions coming in from the audience. Maybe we'll start reading some of these out. Um, so this first one came from Isabel Peck, and um, this is a question from Magdalene, um, and she says that she would like to come back. I would like to come back to these concepts of utility and aesthetic. Yesterday, you mentioned the notion of containing and the fact that the container remains hollow. Is this need of emptiness related to the sanctity of clay that Douglas talked about? Sorry, is this need of emptiness related to the sanctity of clay that Douglas talked about? Would you consider that the primary use function or use or function of the vessel is completely lost in your works? I hope not. I hope that uh, um, emptiness, um, or as I, I call it, a uh, 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 void space is, is, is as essential as, uh, um, a, you know, sort of, in a sense, a vessel cannot be a vessel unless it has uh, this emptiness or the void space, because the, the that space needs to, you know, sort of is filled with potency, either philosophically or uh, in a utilitarian sense. So, um, uh, for argument's sake, if you're brought up as a cat in in the Catholic religion or in Christianity, you receive. Um, uh, wine or you know the the host in in a vessel you need a vessel you need something that is uh empty to begin with to be filled for it to become to, to become to to become an agency of sharing uh so you cannot you in in a way you cannot have a vessel 
without emptiness because that emptiness is there to be filled. I was in North Carolina not long ago where um, uh, uh, really uh, somebody who's become a friend said to make a good jug, you have to make it feel empty when it is empty. A, a, a very poetic way to think about that relationship with, with um, the form and this interplay between inner outer emptiness and, and yet having a, a physicality to it uh, with a vessel. Um, Magdalene, there's, there's another question that's directed uh, for you from Cyan that I'd like to ask. Uh, and Cyan is asking, do you have a particular type of clay that you work with? And if so, what is your relationship to the clay? And do materiality or origin come into play? When I first finished my uh, graduate studies, I, you know, one, one of the biggest motivation for me to go to graduate school was to understand uh, my, the materials I used. And I spent a year and a half, almost two years, just um, trying to understand clay, looking into clays and to, to find a clay that I wanted to work with. So for the first 10 years, I actually mixed my own clays and it's, it's very arduous. You have to, to really uh, be able to find uh, uh, the, the source. And, you know, some of the places where I was getting the clay were closing down anyway, when, uh, you know, the making of bricks was being, you know, uh, uh, mechanized. So now I use a clay that comes from, uh, that's mixed for me in Stoke on Trent, but it's basically a, a red, a red clay. It's a red clay that has a capacity uh, to fire um, to high temperatures, but I fire it uh, in, you know, earthenware temperatures. And it's basically red because I, I find I cannot work in white clay at the moment at all. This, this next question comes from Alyssa Lagama, and um, she asks, in so many studies on ceramics from Barbara Frank to Carol Spindel, the gender of the ceramist is significant, and often in Africa, it is the purview of women. I'd be interested in hearing from Magdalene and Douglas about this cultural dimension. Well, <clears throat> Certainly, that's an important uh, common denominator of, of ceramics, not just in Africa, but pretty much worldwide. It seems that when pottery is hand-built, it is the domain of women. Uh, the minute that ceramics become mechanized, that is the introduction of the potter's wheel, men tend to take over. Uh, so there, that's, it's an interesting gender specificity that I, I don't know what the basis for it is. It's also the same in weaving. Uh, when backstrap looms are done by women, when, when looms become uh, slightly mechanized, men take over. I don't know if it's seductiveness or the re recognition that technology is control or power. It's probably all of that. But yes, it certainly is true that the majority of, of traditional ceramics in Africa are made by women. Um, it's a fundamental way in many African traditional cultures for women to um, gain prestige within the society. I'm thinking specifically uh, of potters that I'm aware of uh, among the Bamana of Mali. Uh, why they conform to a certain canon of form, technique, and material and firing process, there's great flexibility in adornment of the pots within, again, a, a very specific inventory of motifs, but it is how women uh, exert and gain prestige through skill. There are good potters and there are bad potters. And that difference is recognized within the group. And a good potter has prestige. A, a good potter also can create a new motif, name it and pass it on to her daughter or her niece uh, and it becomes essentially a, a property that's, that is uh, almost a commodity. 
Now this changes dramatically when an animistic or traditional culture converts either to Christianity or Islam, when suddenly the presence of, of um, realistic iconography in a pot is forbidden, uh, women's prestige dis declines and pots lose their character completely uh, and become just a generic vessel. There's no more any cultural or individual identity uh, embossed on the pot. Um, but that's, that's certainly a case in a lot of Africa. I mean, there are men who do make hand-built pots, but they are the exception. I, I agree with that. And, and in most cases in, in Africa where uh, studio pottery has been introduced, has always been introduced as a job creation uh, um, element and, and uh, when job creation uh, becomes an economic um, concern, uh, men are the ones who, are, who get trained to, to take up those, uh, uh, you know, those, those arts. Uh, certainly within uh, Nigeria where uh, Michael Kaju in, in um, Ghana and in Nigeria where Michael Kaju set up potteries, he started training men and uh, the one woman that he, uh, he became very close to, Ladi Kwale, who actually was my uh, tutor for three months when I was in Nigeria, um, came into the pottery as uh, a specialist hand builder who then learned how to work on the wheel. But much of Ladi Kwale's work uh, known today in, in, in the West is uh, her, her hand-built pottery. But I think there are certain societies, there's certainly certain societies that are pre uh, pottery is a prestigious occupation. For instance, in, in Uganda, the Baganda potteries, the court potters were always men, men um, and the king uh, employed men to make the pots for 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 the court. So maybe, but that also starts explaining why, in in economic terms, it becomes a ma a man's occupation when there's um, an exchange of uh, money in terms of somebody being employed. Uh, women certainly took the the you know sort of earned. Um, they're living making pots and they took them to the to the markets to sell them and um, but I think I, I totally agree with you there Douglas. There's another interesting component in that gender specificity in that in many particularly in West African traditional societies potters were women were the wives of blacksmiths uh, and in both cases, both individuals, man and woman, took an inert material, either clay or the raw materials of iron, and through fire and through this, uh, this almost alchemic process, produced a tangible object. And that imbued them with great power within, their, within the particular societies and great prestige. It also made them very vulnerable uh, because they were seen as the, the, the holders of, of great potent power. And so when there was conflict often, they were the very first people who were attacked and held responsible for the issues of witchcraft or whatever. But again, the, it, it gave women a great opportunity for self-determination and for power within their particular groups. It's, it's an interesting dialogue that, that's uh, unfolding here around the um, this great sort of symbolic connection with either gender, sex, or, or even life itself that uh, Magdalene and Douglas, you both touched on and Sue Ellen, even when you were speaking earlier about some of these inherent life holding elements that you're finding in, in the material of soil or clay. And it uh, leads to another question. This one is from Janet. And uh, Janet is uh, saying that, my question is for Magdalene, but draws from the wonderful observations Sue Ellen and Douglas made about soil and clay as life-giving elements. 
Uh, Magdalene, yesterday you spoke briefly about the openings you leave at the top of some of your works and their relationship to breath. They allow breath to pass in and out of the vessel, most notably in those you created to honor your parents. Is that symbolic concept consistent in all of your work and does it relate as well to these thoughts about ritual and source that have been expressed today? I certainly think ritual rites of passage is a very important element in my thinking. And, and that is informed by uh, a sense that uh, is imbued in me through uh, life experiences. And it, it's, it's something that I've grown up with because I lost both my parents when I was very young. And in, in, uh, uh, in society where um, uh, it was pre uh, pretty much pre-independence and so the, the social structures of our communities were still intact and both um, you know, sort of our parents had all the rites and pomp and ceremonies that were accorded in a very traditional way where, where the rites of passage could last for, for almost uh, uh, three weeks to a month and where uh, the, the widow or widower would be um, uh, De you would would be um, made to kind of uh, mourn and be visibly um, affected by the death for uh, you know sort of almost two years, and that can that I think to me became a catalyst in in wanting to to perhaps subconsciously capture those, those rituals within my work. So I think that's a good observation of the questioner. This, this, next, question, this next question comes from Heather. Um, uh, she asks, how do you feel about traditional ways of making with clay and the introduction of digital technology 3D printing and its implications. And I, I'm actually kind of wondering as, as we read this and sort of think about some of the different ideas that the conversation touches on, I, I, has touched upon, I wonder if we might expand that question even further. Um, you know, thinking about the, the world that you're working in, Sue Ellen, um, how, how we might think about different kinds of technologies. Is it important to consider the technologies that we're using in moving soil from one place to another or the way in which we're affecting affecting the earth and moving clay in the ways you're describing as well. Magdalene, did you want to do the first part? <laughs> I'm waiting for you to answer that and then I'll chip in. <laughs> um, I suppose really it's a sure. question about technology. Yeah. How, how does technology um, factor into this conversation? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, uh, you know, sort of Sue Ellen is probably, um, you know, in the academic terms more, would be more familiar with this. But in terms of ceramics, I think having taught and Del, you, you know, those of us who teach in, in ceramics department know that uh, there are stages where these new technologies are coming in. And I think we've embra embraced them. Uh, it, it took me quite a long time to understand, um, and I still don't understand a lot of it, but then that actually shows my age. Um, however, I think I, I, I'm familiar enough because I've sat on jury panels where a lot of new technology is being used by uh, younger people, particularly, um, um, what did you call it? Um, digit, you know, sort 3D, of- 3D printing 3D or? 3D printing is coming into force. Um, 
I think fortunately at, at the moment, even the, you know, sort of 3D uh, printing is still, has still got a, 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 a big element and, and the input of the person is still uh, crucial. You can't, I, I'm not sure you can just sort of uh, leave uh, this, this instrument to actually create the work without an input of the person designing the work itself. So there is quite a, a, a big part of uh, human engagement in, in the design of these, these um, pieces. There may be a time when robots can kind of make them. I'm not sure I'll be here to see that. But I think most ceramics department, most art departments have embraced these technologies. Um, I, I think 3D printing is still on a very small scale. And it'll be interesting to see in the next few years how, uh, um, how agile the technique is in, in um, helping the maker uh, create work that is um, uh, unique or you, you know, sort of individual to the person. I think in the 2D aspects of ceramics, I think technology has uh, uh, enabled a lot of very exciting things to happen. I think it's in the, in the 3D aspect of it that it's still slower. They are also in terms of material, going back to Sue Ellen's uh, area, in terms of minerals and materials in ceramics, I think there, there are endless opportunities. I think anything you want to, to kind of uh, uh, make in terms of color, in terms of, um, there used to be a time when trying to make Egyptian paste was uh, a three year, six year research for, for somebody in the ceramics department. I think those things can be made within uh, 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 two, three year degree course now. So I think technology has, has helped quite a lot. Um, in, you, you can actually get tiles that are fired to even three, 300 degrees centigrade. I don't know what that is in, in Fahrenheit. And the, the patterns uh, become non-porous. It's, it's, it's just amazing. It's endless, really. I feel like I, I think a lot about technology in my work and I feel like um, and in, in, in relation to ceramics and I feel like often, you know, just as humans to really oversimplify, I feel like often our um, uh, 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 ways of thinking about technology can become very binary. You know, it's like yeah. either technology is going to be the end of humanity or it's going to save us. Um, and I, I feel like, and this maybe relates to the use of technology in, in ceramic art, you know, I, I feel like I'm always sort of waiting for or trying to build maybe more nuanced um, conversations around the way that we use and think about technology. And I guess maybe coming back to you, Sue Ellen, like I wonder if there are interesting technologies or technologies that feel sort of exciting to you um, in relation to some of these ideas of about how how clay and soil does the thing it, it needs to do does the things it needs to do in order for it to serve as a vessel of civilizations um. yeah that's it's interesting question um, I think you know to go to your is technology going to save us or, you know, cause us to collapse? Um, technology is is something that humans build, right? It's some, it's it's out of our own ingenuity, and um, I think it, with that lies a responsibility for us to use our technologies <laughs> um, ethically and responsibly, um, and to use them. For us to to find the benefit in technologies instead of um, you know 
just experimenting for the sake of experimenting and, you know, to, to speak to what Madeline said about, you know, maybe robots are going to be making art one day. Well, where does that, where does that then lie in our experiences and how we relate and, and the benefits that we gain from that art, both as the maker and as the appreciator? Um, because I think that whole dynamic would shift and technology is a big piece of that. It's how we interpret the world using that in technology. Um, and so within the, within the field of soil science, we're looking to use technology to make the world a better place, right? And to look at where we've come from, for example, in, um, in the agricultural field, um, we've overutilized technology to some degree, and we've really, you know, to go back to this idea of rep reciprocity, you know, we've taken from the land, we've taken so much from the land at these timescales that, that aren't being able to be replenished. And so this vessel that's created or that exists for us um, is, is something that we've taken and taken and taken from because of the increase in technology. And I think our study and, and realizing that has spurred this responsibility to give back to the land using technologies. And um, for example, technologies in, um, in um, genetic engineering, right? And creating drought tolerant crops and just having an understanding of that and using that tool as a benefit and not as, a, as something that's, that's you know, it's a tool and it's not something that's gonna save us necessarily um, in the end. But uh, I think that we can look at these technologies from lots of different perspectives and from the soil perspective, we're using it pretty heavily now um, in making our ecosystems and understanding that we have ecosystem services that we need to protect and that we're part of these systems. We're not, we're managers of the systems, but we're also part of these systems and that we're not just here to take, 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 but we're also here to return. Um, and the soil is a prime place to do that as we're producing food and we want to use things like um, GIS technologies and being more precise about and more intentional about what we're doing. And I think the technology also allows us to bridge art and science together, right? Art is science and science is art um, in a lot of different ways. And um, these are just a couple of examples of how that is. Um, yeah. I think science has certainly, science analysts, geologists, and you know, people who make who, who separate materials to make all the colors that we use in, you know, uh, in ceramics has enabled a lot more uh, people who would have been in, in, in all these categorized areas of, of art. Um, has, it's, it's enabled more people to engage with clay. And I think clay, as I said yesterday, has become a medium a, a, a material that is being used widely in all sorts of uh, uh, areas and by a lot of people, particularly within the, the context of making, as we know it in, in, in the, the so-called developed world or the West as an art form. And, uh, you know, galleries are, are, are now packed with people who, who've never studied in ceramics department are used, you know, sort of making work uh, within, you know, with clay. I'm not sure that everybody who, who actually makes that move and who's making in, 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 in clay is aware of the, the sensitivity of the materials in, in the way you, you, you speak about Suelen, but perhaps if one thing a symposia like this will, uh, can do is to, to, to bring this awareness to, to a, wider, uh, a, a wider population and those of us who are engaged in, in using the materials 
to express ourselves and to make expressive items for other people to consume. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an intriguing discussion thinking about the, that role of technology with both the object and with even the media itself and, and thinking about where this is eventually going to be taking us. Uh, we have uh, under 10 minutes, so maybe time for, for perhaps one, uh, one final question. I want to uh, also share a remark that was posted on the discussion board from Marius. Uh, it's sharing, uh, assigning qualia or degrees of consciousness to matter in itself may not transcend the subject object uh, Cartesianism, um, the language of which seems to constrain all of us. The circularity that Dave was talking about, which is not only metaphorical, is a way of thinking the openness of both the pot, for example, and the kind of being that we are. Um, a question uh, that I have here from Haneda, uh, I believe this is uh, aimed at, at you, Magdalene. I've read that you fire your pots twice the first resulting in a luminous terracotta and the second in a black bronze-like surface. What kind of control do you have in the balance of colors that we see in the final pots or do you allow the firings to surprise you or do you do both? I certainly do both. And, and the, the secondary firings as I call them can be, you know, uh, and, until I, uh, I, I attain the, the surface that I want of that particular work. So sometimes it can take, it, it can be five, you know, three, four, five firings. Um, the, the ones that remain terracotta are always, um, in, you know, sort of, they always invite remaining uh, that once fired, um, but it's, it's, uh, I have to admit that the once fired pieces are very uh, difficult to, to achieve because they have to be uh, near uh, what one would call a, a perfect surface without a blemish because it, it shows. Um, but yes, there are multiple firings. Um, I can uh, put another one out here while well, we have a few more minutes. This one is a, a question from Jada uh, asking, I often see traces of the body in your work, uh, Magdalene, a spine poking out the back of a pod or a round belly. Can you speak about the intentionality in this if there is any? I'm also interested in the blackness of your surface and your tendency to create depth in ordinary flat color. Is this something you think about both aesthetically and conceptually? Uh, there are two questions there. I mean, first of all, I think um, the, uh, I almost always feel that the, pe <clears throat> the pieces I make are, are born from wanting to make those vessels very much inspired by uh, a human being or our humanness as it were. So embellishing them with amateurs and, uh, you know, sort of belly buttons and, 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 and uh, nodules just enables the piece to, 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 to kind of turn and make the shape that um, arrests the stances that you find in, in a static, uh, um, human body, you know, person, uh, particularly in, in movement and dance when, when um, a, move, a, a perfect movement is achieved by uh, the, the contortion of a body. So that, that is a deliberate uh, way of animating something that is uh, 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 very static in the first place. Um, the surfaces, it is something that I spent a lot of time working on when I was on my graduate course. I wanted to, to, to have um, a plain surface, uh, to attain a plain surface that enhanced the form of the, 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 the piece itself so that it didn't have, um, and, you know, sort of 
it complemented the, the form and, and the concentration then was on the form rather than on the surface. So the hard work that goes into the surface is only to enhance the piece itself. Wonderful. Well, we're coming close to the end of our time here. So I, I think we're perhaps at a natural stopping point. I'd just like to take a moment on behalf of uh, myself, Dell, and, and all of our viewers. Thank you all so much for participating. Sue Ellen, Douglas, and Magdalene, this was beyond what, uh, what any of our hopes were, I know, from, from the planning side of things. And so we just really appreciate this time and the wonderful insight and the great dynamism that, uh, that the three of you shared with this panel. Thank you very much. I'd really like to thank Douglas and Sue Ellen for helping this conversation and for you, Dave and Del, um, organizing such a wonderful virtual way of, of meeting. Uh, and it's a shame that I can't see the audience, <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, panelists. And, and also, thank you so much to our audience. Thanks for joining us um, this morning, spending your Saturday morning with us, um, or Saturday evening if you're in, in the UK, like Magdalene. Um, the, there will be a video recording of um, both of our events, uh, Magdalene's lecture yesterday, as well as the panel discussion today. Um, that'll be available on the Colorado State University Department of Art and Art History YouTube channel. Um, and you can also find that just by going through um, the Colorado State Department of Art and Art History uh, website. Um, please feel free to contact Dave or myself um, if you need help, if you have any issues locating it. Um, I've been recording this and we'll do a little bit of, um, uh, of editing, just a slight bit of editing of the video and then we'll get that posted in the next couple of days. So it should be up there shortly. Um, I feel like there was so much, I mean, thank you again to our panelists for sharing so generously. I feel like I'm gonna need to watch this. <laughs> panel a few more times just to get everything out of it, which you all have offered us. So thank you again. Thank you. Hope to see you in real soon. <laughs> <laughs> and Douglas, all the best. Thank you. Great to see you again. And you too. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Nice meeting Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.